week, we get a chance to talk with Brad Keithley about uh, topics in the state ranging from oil and gas to taxes and tax policy to budgets. And uh, today we get a chance to talk about the recent Supreme Court case in the PFD and more. Brad Keithley joins us this morning uh, to discuss that. Good morning, sir. Welcome back. Michael, thanks for having me. Uh, good morning to you also. So um, on Friday, we got handed a piece, kind of a bitter pill. Um, I don't know as I really expected anything different, but the Alaska Supreme Court, in a, it was a very narrow ruling um, because it looked at a very specific set of uh, uh, principles and statutes that talked about uh, how the PFD is paid out. Uh, what was your take on it? Was this what you were expecting? And and what's your take? And what does the aftermath mean for uh, the citizens in the state here and the and the future of the PFD, uh, the permanent fund dividend payout? Well, to be honest, I never put a lot of of weight on the Supreme Court appeal. Uh, it was uh, a nice thing to do. I compliment Senator Wilikowski and uh, Rick Halford and um, and Clintillion for pursuing it. But I never really had um, – never put a lot of weight on it for two reasons. One, you're talking about a statute. Uh, the, PFD stat, the, the PFD is created by statute, and it can be changed by statute. And so to me, the big battle, the major battle always has been in the legislature and with the governor about their proposals to change the statute, even if uh, we, the, Senator Wilikowski had won the Supreme Court case we were still going to be battling that statutory change because anything the Supreme Court did wasn't going to say you can't change the statute. It was simply going to say as long as that statute's in existence, then the funds are dedicated. So it, it's always – to me, it's always been sort of a secondary battle that's been going on as opposed to the primary battle. And the primary battle, regardless of how the Supreme Court came out, would have um, would have uh, continued on and does continue on now. So that's – that's really where we need to focus our energies on the on 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 keeping the legislature and the governor away from permanently uh, changing changing the PFD. Yeah, which of course was one of the uh, stipulations early on in the last session, not this not this recent session, but the session before last. That of course was part of Governor Walker's plan was to turn this into a sovereign wealth fund where it essentially would decouple it from the original intent of what the framers of the PFD wanted and basically tie it to a completely different matrix, uh, which would have not only reduced Alaska's PFD in the, in, the, in the long run, but also by decoupling it from the permanent fund corpus, it would have opened that up for some kind of constitutional challenge in the future, uh, which could have been, I mean, really devastating the future of the state of Alaska, giving the legislature access to that 50 plus billion dollar fund overall. Yeah, we're and 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 we're not out of the stat, we're not out of those changes yet. I mean, we're not out of the woods on those yet. Uh, Governor Walker's made that proposal. He's continued to make that proposal. Uh, the Senate bought off on it. The Republican Senate bought off on it last year uh, and adopted legislation that would have permanently cut the PFD. The House, as part of their package, uh, fiscal package, has adopted the PFD cut. Governor Walker talks about that in a recent interview on KTUU about how both bodies separately have agreed to PFD cuts. And, and we're going we're gonna to continue to face that if we have a special session in October. We're going to continue to face that in the next legislative session. And then we're, and that's gonna, I think it's going to be a big issue in the, uh, in the, next, uh, in the next election. So this, this Supreme Court case was never going to alter that. What it essentially was going to say is as long as the statute's not changed, you've got to give priority to the money. Uh, got to give priority to the PFD, but it was never this. This case was never going to say that essentially that the, that the statute's part of the Constitution. You can't change the statute. That was never going to be the result of the case. So the battle, the battle always needs to rage around what the legislature, what the legislature is doing, what the governor is doing, and 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 preventing them from taking what what ICER and others call uh, a step that would have the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. Let's uh, now we, what does this do for the discussion that I know that there's several groups out there that are working right now to to cuz cuz again this is a very narrow ruling and when it, it was in regards to the constitutional uh, merits of dedicated funds and other things like that there are a couple groups that are talking about putting forward <clears throat> excuse me a constitutional amendment that would enshrine this component of the PFD into 
into the Constitution instead of putting making it subject to statute and subject to appropriation. Um, do you support that? And do you see this as being the only way that something like this can can be protected in the future? Well, let me let me take the second question first. Yes, um, it, if if your goal is to is to absolutely protect the PFD as it's currently structured against all changes, uh, against almost all changes, uh, constitutionalizing it, I think what Senator Dunleavy calls constitutionalizing it, is the, uh, is the way to do that because it's never going to be protected as long as it sits in the statute. The statute can always be changed. So constitutionalizing it is, is the way to protect it. And, and I think this decision probably uh, adds added weight to those who, are, who want to constitutionalize it uh, because it shows that there's no really no other way to protect it against statutory changes or indeed now annual appropriation changes. I mean that's the that's the big effect right. of the court's decision. Um, so yeah, I think I think those I think that effort has a lot of merit to it, and I think it uh, is something that uh, that has uh, 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 um, so some added weight to it uh, as a result of the court's decision. I, I support it. Um, uh, and I and I will and I will give money to it, and I'll be involved to the extent the sponsors want me to be involved in a con- in the constitutional campaign. But I'm not going to I'm not going to bet my bottom dollar on on that succeeding. Um, uh, I'm not going to put my last bit of effort into that succeeding. Uh, I think I think the real battle is going to come with the governor and in the legislature. As I said, if we go into special session in October and next session. And I think the real, real battle is going to be in the election next year uh, about whether we can elect representatives and, and a governor who will protect the PFD um, as opposed to as opposed to relying on the somewhat of a hail mary of of passing a constitutional amendment. Well, and and do you think that I mean this is uh, I'll be honest with you I think that in some ways this is a misstep by a lot of these elected officials. Um, in supporting these, this notion of the governor's uh, plan and of the Senate and the House's plan, uh, the various plans to change the PFD, because the majority of them are now going to have to go back and face re-elections. And the, if I was an opponent of theirs, whoever they were, uh, regardless of their party, persuasion, chamber, or whatever, uh, the first thing and the only drum that I would be beating from the word go would be these are the people that wanted to cut your PFD or cut your PFD. I mean, that would be the first. And, that'd be the first and only thing I would. That'd be the first and only thing that I would be hitting them with each and every time. This is really going to be very hard for these people to justify come election time. Absolutely, Michael. And and I wrote a piece the other day. Uh, people can find it on my blog if they want to read it. But I, I wrote a piece the other day that said it's it's not basically it's not only that it's not only that you voted to cut the PFD. You voted against the overall Alaska economy. You voted. For the very thing that that every economic analysis that's been done the last two years says has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy, and has the largest am- impact by far quotes by far those are Iser's words uh, on Alaska families. You voted for the very thing that that hurts the Alaska economy the most, hurts Alaska you know, Alaska families the most at the time that we're in a recession. At the time right. that we should be, at the time we shouldn't even be doing that. So, it's not only that you cut the PFD. It's not only that you somehow, um, uh, you know, took money out of Alaska, out, out, out of Alaskans' pockets. That's bad enough. But you voted against the economy and you voted against Alaska families. That's that's the campaign pitch that I think, you know, I, I, that's the one I would use, uh, as you as you just said. That's the one I would use if I were running against Walker. That's the one I would use. If I were running against senators and representatives that voted uh, to, to undertake that action, Republicans, you say you're a Republican, you say you're a pro-business Republican. You can't say that if you voted against the PFD. You can't say that if you voted against the very thing that has the largest adverse impact on the Alaska economy. You want to say that you're pro-family? You can't say that if you voted against the PFD. Because it, quote, by far, close quote, has the largest adverse impact on Alaska families. You can't say you're pro-business. You can't say you're pro-family if you voted to cut the PFD. 
Right. Well, and, and again, I think this is this is the mantra. You know, we've talked about the things that need to change in the state government to make an impact, to, to be able to bring this government back to heel. And we talked about changing the players, changing the location of the legislative session, changing the rules so that they have to abide by all this. But that number one thing, the easiest thing to do right now is to change the players. And this is the number one club with which we can utilize uh, you know, to 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 beat this to to make this to beat this drum to make this happen is to remind people that these are the folks that took this stuff away from you uh, and and shot it from the rooftops vociferously each and every day as they go back because, like you said, the one thing that was going to hurt the economy the most, these people chose to make that decision uh, faster than anything else. I had a conversation yesterday with a uh, uh, with someone who's a business owner, and they said they got a chance to. Uh, they got a chance to uh, 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 fly down with some members, senior members of the state Senate. And uh, he said they were, they, 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 it was like there was no crisis. I mean, this is after everything's gone. And, and he you know, was asking him questions about the state of the economy and everything else. And he's like, oh, no, everything's fine. Everything's fine. Don't worry. Everything's great. It's going to, you know, the economy's going to do great. All this. It's like he's totally out of touch with what's going on out there. Well, so it's I mean it shows it shows how segmented and and how sort of out of touch our senators and representatives are in their uh, uh, social class in their economic class in their income class class yeah they're doing fine but you go down into the into the into the working class Alaskans you go down into the middle income segment the lower middle income segment and the low and the low income segment and things are not going fine. We, we are finding, you know, we're finding people that are that are having uh, loss of jobs. We're finding people that are having income cuts. We find people moving into poverty that hadn't been before. We find all sorts of things going on once we get down into those levels um, uh, that that are not good. So yeah, if you st- if you stick around with your buddies in the top 20 percent, yeah, everything's fine. Hell, you know, uh, they cut my PFD. So what? That was sort of a nickel that I had to toss into the box. Good for me. Uh, guess what? I avoided an income tax by doing that. Um, you, you hang around with those people, and they'll tell you everything's fine. But you get out where Alaskans are, where the for the other 80 percent are, and you find out things are not going fine. And and that's I mean that that's the question: Will those 80 percent come out to vote, and will they will they make their decisions based upon based upon what the legislature has done to them, uh, what Alaska's leaders have done to them? Um, uh, or not. And, and I'm hopeful they will. Uh, and I'm hopeful we're able to articulate the issues in the election so that they understand what that vote's about. Uh, but that's, that's the question, whether they will come out and vote on that issue. Well, and this leads us to a whole other section, and that is, uh, you know, like you said, these people are basically in denial about what's going on. We're seeing the same thing happen in the various cities and municipalities across the state. Devin Kelly's got an article in the ADN talking about how there's at least eight communities around the state that have tax measures on the ballots in October. And uh, I was talking again with an elected official from one of the municipalities yesterday, and he basically said, what are they thinking? There is no appetite for new taxes in the state right now. Everybody's in full on, you know, worry, worry mode about what's going on. Uh, do they really think that these things are going to pass? I mean, in some cases they might because they're unfelt. Uh, like I think it's Petersburg is going to be charging uh, more on fuel that's bought at their docks versus other things. But any other tax that affects the broad tax base of citizens, uh, I'm not sure that it has a chance of really passing. Yeah, I don't. I I, I don't have a good feel for that. Local local issues are local issues, and and outside of the localities where I spend a lot of my time, Anchorage and Fairbanks, I really don't have a lot of a lot of feel for what's going on in those local issues. I will say that there is that there's a knock-on effect of of those of those local measures on on state policy. The local measures, in to, to some degree, are trying to raise sales taxes. That's how the localities are trying to survive. As 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 state government shrinks, more responsibility goes back to the localities. Some are trying to raise revenues through increased sales taxes. So when people talk at the state level about, oh, one of the things, one of the alternatives we've got is to do a statewide sales tax, I think that's, I think that's just, I think that's going the wrong direction because what you're going to do is you're going to, again, sales taxes are, are, are regressive, right? They hit, the, they hit the lower income classes more than they hit the higher income classes. So higher income classes are all for them. 
because they essentially are able to shove the responsibility for paying for government off to the lower income classes. As localities do that, as they start to move um, uh, toward sales taxes or increased sales taxes as a way of, of raising local revenues, if the state piled on and put a state sales tax on top of that, that's just even more regressive. It's, yeah. it's, hurting, it's hurting those who are least able to deal with it uh, even more uh, on top at the state level, on top of the local level. So I think those are going to have knock-on effects. If they do increase local taxes, state sales taxes, I think it's going to have an effect on the state. Brad, hold on one second. We'll pick this up on the other side. Uh, we'd like to continue this discussion on taxes and more. Plus, we got maybe some phone calls as well. Don't go anywhere. The Michael Duke Show, your hope for common sense radio. Brad Keithley is our guest. We continue with him now. Uh, we're going to jump into it uh, as we continue the discussion on taxation. Uh, and we're going to also take some calls here in just one second. Uh, Brad, uh, the, you, know, you mentioned that you're only kind of in the know as far as local taxes uh, for Fairbanks and Anchorage, because that's where you spend a lot of your time. One of the ones that caught my attention, of course, coming from Fairbanks, was this discussion about inside the city. They're talking about increasing the uh, increasing the mill rate. And again, meaning that homeowners are going to pay about $125 a year more, hoping to make up $1.7 in taxes. I've talked to some folks there. Uh, I don't think that they're going to be interested in that. The city of Anchorage is talking about whether or not to add a $0.10 cents a gallon gas tax. I mean, there, there's all this scrambling, and it always seems like what it is is it seems like a lack of effort or interest in cutting the size and scope of these governments as well. I don't think that many of them are as bloated as the state government, but it just seems like that is always the last alternative for these folks. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I think we're hitting a crunch point, not only at the state level. I think we certainly recognize to some degree we're hitting it at the state level but also now at the local level about what do you want your government to be and how much do you want to pay for it? Um, and, uh, and, and these tax issues, both of the discussion at the state level and at the local level certainly is, is bringing that to the front uh, for years when we, when, when we could rely on, on oil taxes at both the state level and then indirectly through revenue sharing at the, at the local level uh, people said, Oh yeah, you want a new, you want a new library? Yeah, let's build that. You want a new park? Yeah, let's build that. You want a new athletic arena? Yeah, let's build that. You want two new engineering buildings at Fairbanks and Anchorage? Yeah, let's build that. I mean, and it was sort of like, it was sort of like we were only constrained by the limits of our imagination. Right. And, and even sometimes not even that about what we wanted to build. Now that, now that we're having to go to citizens and say, are you willing to, to pay an additional amount for that? I think we're hitting the crunch point on, and, and where we're going to find out uh, uh, exactly what people do want in terms of their government. People are, are going to be confronted with: Do you want a loss? Do you want less government in a certain area, less government services in a different area, or do you want to pay more in terms of taxes to get that? And that's the right. That's actually the right decision to be to be made. And and putting it at the local level is rightly is actually the right place to put it. I mean, it's going to going to force people to confront whether they want those additional things that are going to be lost. If they don't have it, I'm 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 fine with them taking it to the populace, and I'm fine with the populace voting it down. And frankly, I'm fine with the populace approving it if that's what they want to do, if that's the decision they make that they want to pay additional amounts. Uh, but that's that's where we've gone. I mean, now we're going to have to confront these things at both the state and the local level in terms of personal things, uh, yeah. in terms of whether we're prepared to do that. Absolutely. I want to get into the cashable tax credits in this article in the ADN, but Jay's on the line. He's got a question for Brad. Jay, what's your question? Hey, well, kind of a comment more than a question. I'm, I'm listening to the discussion, and I don't uh, terribly frequently find something philosophically on your show that I disagree with as viscerally, but uh, um, I, there's kind of three things that came up in the last conversation as general principles, and I just wanted to mention them if we have time, I'd like to explore one. But the first is that the top 20% are doing well in the state of Alaska in current circumstances, and I don't think that's accurate. It may be to some extent, but to a large extent, I don't believe that it is. There are lots of people particularly related to the oil industry that are packing up and leaving or losing jobs, and, and that's causing their houses to become empty, which means everyone who buys houses at that price range is seeing a drop in the value of their own home, even if they've maintained their job. Secondly, uh, the idea that what's good in the state, the top 20% is somehow different from what's good for the real Alaska, 
I think what's good for the real Alaska is going to benefit the top 20% as well. Um, and then thirdly, the idea particularly related to a sales tax, that a sales tax is regressive and somehow less desirable than an income tax or a property tax, both of which I would describe as repressive, and we can only talk about one, the idea of which tax uh, systems cause the most harm and the most dishonest would be the one that I probably have the most passion around. Okay. Brad, you want to take those one at a time real quick? Well, let, 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 let me see if I can. The first one, the top 20% suffering also, yeah, that's probably right. Uh, but they're not suffering. It's disproportionate. They're not suffering as much as the as the uh, the lower incomes are. When you take away 30 percent of somebody's income, which is what the PFD cut has done to the to the lowest income segment, the lowest 20 percent. When you take away 15 percent of their income, which is what the PFD cut has done to the next 20 percent, you're 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 pounding them in the face. Yes, the top 20 percent, which has lost all of less than two percent of their income may have may, may be having an issue uh, and they and certainly job loss is an issue for them but the real gut punches that we're delivering to uh, to our economy are going on uh, in the other 80 percent not the 20 percent uh, secondly uh, I, I I don't disagree about the fact that the sales taxes is, is is somehow uh, 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 well I, I do disagree. Sales tax is more I'm honest is kind of my point. If you, if you, and I'm I, sorry I, to, to break in, but I want to be clear. Uh, if everyone pays a sales tax, everyone sees it, and it appears regressive because the, the lower income groups can see what the tax does to them. If you place in a property tax, their rent goes up. They don't know that that's because of the tax, and they're priced out of home ownership. They don't know that that's because of the tax. And if someone has a change in income because they lost their job, they may lose their house even if they paid it off because of the tax. And so the property taxes hurt the poor people just as much. You've just hidden from them that it's caused by the tax, whereas the sales tax, they look at their receipt, they know it, and then they join in with the rest of us in saying, wow, this tax is excessive. And so what you do well, when you make it some other kind of tax is just make it dishonest. Oh, I disagree with that. I the sales tax. The sales tax is is regressive. There's there's no two ways around that. I mean, you, when you look at um, at the economics of it, you look at the analyses of it that have been done by ITEP and others during this last session. It is clear that the sales tax is regressive. It's not as regressive as a PFD cut, uh, but it's more regressive than 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 any other form of of, uh, of ta statewide taxation that the, that the states looked at. They've not looked at statewide property tax. Uh, but it is more, but it is more uh, visible. It, it, but it is more visible in the, in regard to what Jay's saying. I do agree that it is more visible, meaning they do see it more than kind of the hidden nature of a, you know, where things are kind of rolled in. But that does not mean that it's not regressive. Yeah, well, that it, it it's more visible than than a property tax. Yes, but we're not talking about a property tax at the state, at the, at the statewide level. It is. It, well, and, and, and and so we're talking. Yes. If I could just say, if you're talking about an income tax, the other part you don't see with an income tax is that those income taxes for everyone who pays them get rolled into the price of things, too. They just don't show up. And when you talk about an income tax, you're also talking about people then making a decision of, is it worth staying here? You know, if taking an extra part-time job um, means that I have enough money to buy a house uh, cabin on on the Kenai, then what that is is a job for somebody that's going to build it or a sale for somebody who owns it, and that's income for them. If taking a part-time job means I get taxed more, it may mean that you just take those things away. And the the hidden cost of of income tax is hard to see. How many pack up and leave the state? How many don't take extra jobs? How many don't take extra? You know, if you own your own business, you don't expand because of the law of diminishing returns, and those are things, those lost jobs, lost opportunities, those are things that hit the the the, uh, the lower income groups disproportionately. Oh, baloney. Uh, they don't hit, the, an income tax does not hit the lower income groups disproportionately. There is no economic analysis that ever, ever, ever has said that. Sales taxes hit the income, hit the lower, PFD cuts hit the lowest 
income class the most. Sales tax hit the hit the uh, lower income classes the next most. Income taxes are somewhere way the heck down the down the line, and that is and that is every economic analysis that's been done uh, been done the last two years. Yeah, it may be hidden, uh, may be hidden, uh, but but ICER has nevertheless analyzed it. ITEP nevertheless analyzed it, and both of them came to the conclusion that that PFD cuts and sales taxes hit the lower 80 percent, the other 80 percent, a heck of a lot more than an income tax does. And it hits the overall state economy a heck of a lot more than an income yeah, tax does. absolutely. Jay, I appreciate your call, but we are running out of time, and I do want to get to this uh, oil and gas tax credit issue. Brad, Alex DeBarman in the ADN, finally, it seems like, got a pretty even-handed uh, uh, article up about the oil and gas tax credits, about how it's more about PR and spin at this point. My favorite quote was from John Hendricks, who's the oil and gas uh, advisor for the governor, and he basically said uh, he was pretty skeptical that the officials in the past had oversold the tax credit program. He said, show me the quotes that validate that. I love how the different organizations are saying, well, look at this colorful cartoon pamphlet. This promised us and I think you have rightly asserted that, no, no, that's not how it works. You look at the statute, you look at the law, you look at the fine print. These lawyers and, and these companies knew going in what this was all about. Yeah, I've got to compliment Alex for that article. For anybody who's interested in the cashable oil tax credit program, that is an article that they, that they need to read. Unlike some of the other stuff that's been out there, KTVA um, uh, and you know a, a, a piece on – uh, a radio program that you and I discussed a couple of weeks ago that have just sort of bought the the oil industry, these companies, uh, positions, hook, line, and sinker. Uh, Alex did a very balanced job, I think, and laid out both the best arguments from the companies and the best arguments, I think, from those who who think that uh, uh, that we don't that we shouldn't be uh, paying as much, paying more than the statutory obligation with respect to these credits. Uh, the, the the quote that got me you, you you did John's quote which I thought was a very good good one the quote that got me was one in there where one of the uh, of the companies said uh, well yeah that it may have said that in the fine print but uh, <laughs> we relied on what on what we thought was the overall intent of the program and and we sort of relied on that well that's just baloney I'm, I'm, maybe I'm just using that word too much this segment but that's just <laughs> baloney. The, these companies don't operate that way. They have lawyers. They have financial advisors. They read the fine print. By gosh, that's that's how you make money in the industry sometimes. You read the fine print, and you know what your rights and obligations are, and you know where, where your money's coming from, and you know what you don't have to pay. That's the fine print. And for them to say, well, it may have been buried in the fine print, but we, we relied on this cartoon uh, that showed we get a bunch of money, uh, that just – I, I – <laughs> You know, I started laughing at that point because that's just that's just a ridiculous argument to say that we didn't read the fine print. Yeah, no, and and I and I keep I keep hearing that, and of course we've had multiple articles in in various news outlets that keep bemoaning the fact that we're not upholding our promises, that we're not doing this, and we're not doing that. And I think Debarban does a great job of basically saying, well, we paid what the law says we were supposed to pay. That's that's how it is. Uh, I don't see any changes to that. Now, there is interesting that they talks about this lawsuit that Kalis has brought up. Uh, was it Crest? I can't remember who it was. I think it was Kalis. Anyway, talking about how they're saying, no, we want to make sure we get our money in the future. Um, and uh, and what's, what's your take on that part of it? Well, that's Miller Energy. Uh, it's not Kalis. Miller, sorry. Uh, it's Miller. Yeah. And, and, and Miller's got a unique situation in the, in the Cook Inlet where they've gone through a bankruptcy, uh, and currently the the claim they have or the claim the state has against them for a certain amount pre-bankruptcy is sort of working its way through the courts. Miller said, "Look, you're holding five million. The state's holding five million dollars that Miller claims they're due. Uh, the state's holding that because the state's offsetting it against claims that the state has against Miller for pre-bankruptcy." And Miller says, look, you know, if we win the case that you're not entitled to withhold that $5 million, we want to make sure the cash is there. It's a, it's a unique situation, and I understand where both parties are on that. Well, it's a fascinating discussion. Hopefully we cleared some air out there. We got through a lot of baloney. That's what it's all about. Brad, thanks so much for coming on. <laughs> thanks for having me, Michael. As always, it's a colorful discussion, if nothing else. The Michael Duke Show continues. 
the fastest three hours in radio. 